Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Newman. I'm a Byte Wrangler at uh, Automatic. And today I'm going to take you through how we scale WordPress uh, on WordPress.com. And I'm going to do so by taking you through a little tale of two systems, two distinct systems, but they are uh, joined. Um, but before I go into that too much, just a little bit about Automatic. Automatic is the company behind WordPress.com, Jetpack, WooCommerce, all WordPress-related um, products, really, and even Gravatar, which you would have seen probably on Stack Overflow. If you've got your little face in the avatar there, that's Gravatar. Um, the company is, is very focused on open source. It's open source driven. The founder is actually one of the founders of WordPress itself, so it's a, it's a very open source first company, which is very important for us. We're, we're all about democratizing publishing, and you know the word freedom is used um, liberally throughout all of our internal documentation and just literally the way that we work. Um, we're also a 100% distributed company, so we're all over the world. Literally the entire globe is covered with automaticians, as we're called. Um, as of last count, actually, I just found out 542 people as of this morning um, in over 50 countries speaking a myriad of languages. And uh, one interesting point about the, the way that we do business and the way that we, we sort of manage our projects internally is that we don't use email whatsoever in the company. We use a theme on WordPress, P2, and what each team has their own P2 and projects often spin off with their own P2s and all collaboration is done through that. What's quite cool about it is that it really facilitates asynchronous communication as well as real-time communication. And then of course we do have Slack as well, which everybody knows, like the trumped up IRC of today. We use that um, actively as well to, to run the whole, the whole sort of uh, development side of the, the business. But let's just jump in, jump in here. I'm gonna go quite quickly through this today. I think I've got quite a few slides to jump through, so I'm gonna motor a little bit, but maybe you can just ask questions at the end or if you want some more clarification or maybe you can catch me later at lunch or this evening at drinks. But um, if you go onto WordPress website and you look, there's a little infographic that tries to explain or just uh, uh, splits, most of you probably know this of course, the difference between WordPress.org and the difference between WordPress.com. So WordPress.org is the free software you can go and download, you can put it on a server, you can uh, one, or two, one or two clicks and you're up and running and you can do your own thing, you can bring your themes, you can customize it and in some instances make it a little insecure, but that's a different story. And then you have WordPress.com on this side which is a fully managed uh, hosted ex uh, experience. We basically take care of everything, we pre-vet all the themes that go on there, everything is uh, performance orientated, it doesn't, get in, doesn't go anywhere unless it's performant, very strict test, uh, sort of tests and vetting goes on, on with that. Um, so that maps quite nicely to the two systems that I'm going to be speaking about today. One is WordPress.com, obviously, and that is a single WordPress installation with multi-site, and we have roughly 120 million sub-sites at the moment running in that on a single WordPress installation. So it really is about scaling WordPress. I don't think there's anything bigger out there, so some of the things you'll, you'll see today is if you want to scale your site, if you use some of it, you'll be good. And the other one I'm going to talk about is VIP Go, which is a new container-based VIP hosting that we do. We put our very big clients on there. It's, um, it's container-based and uh, sort of the new, new way we're going. It, it allows you to install a, a WordPress.org instance of, of WordPress and add your own themes and sort of do your own thing, but there is a little bit of control, which we'll get to a little bit later as well, just to ensure we don't have any of the security or performance issues that can creep in. So just jumping straight into WordPress.com itself, as I said, largest multi-site to date, as far as we're aware of. Um, we have this ethos in the systems team. I'm on the systems team as part of the DevOps uh, side of things. And we strongly adhere to the whole ethos that simplicity scales. It's got to be simple, because if it's not simple, it ain't going anywhere. It's not going to multiply. So this is something we live by day in and day out. So I'm gonna, what I've done is I've taken WordPress.com and I'm just sort of doing these verticals. I've uh, split it up and just going to focus on each one of them a little bit just to show some of the things and how, it, how it's relevant as to how it scales uh, to over 120 million sites. So there's the app, the database, going to focus on static content, a little bit about caching, how we distribute the workload that's uh, not necessary to user experience. Um, networking, how we've tackled that at the data center, how we've tackled that uh, globally to, to improve the response time for our users. Of course, protecting is important in the modern era, you all know that. Continuous integration, because it's pointless having something up if you can't change the bloody thing. And then stats and analysis so we can actually uh, monitor it in real time and make, make decisions as we go. So, jumping straight in the app. Of course, PHP based, as everybody knows. The number one and most important point there is it's free open source software. This is something that's very important to us and obviously marries quite nicely with WordPress itself. 
Um, it's also, of, I think in the last uh, stat I saw, it's 83% of detectable server-side language, uh, languages out on the internet today. So that's a very large portion of the internet. And with that, you get a lot of development happening with it. There's a huge passionate community behind it. And we get notable performance increases for free with that. Now, that's a very awesome thing. So I'm the, from 5.5 to 5.6, I believe, we had a, like a 20% less cores required to run the same stuff. When you've got several thousand servers, that's a bonus. So, and another notable uh, increase happened in PHP 7 as well, which is great. Then looking at WordPress software itself, uh, also top, top line there, free open source, as you all know. And it also, as of last count, 27% of the top 10 million websites are running WordPress. Now that means it's a huge, huge amount of, uh, of sites out there. It also means huge attack vector, but that's a separate thing. But it also means that it's passionately developed and, and, and obviously out in the, uh, in the field used widely, widely adopted. And one of the key things about WordPress that makes it slightly different and actually gives you a lot of power and also is uh, one of the things that, um, that, that allows people to give extensibility is that we can, you can customize it and change things, you can theme it, you can plug in, you can do all these fancy things as you all know. And what we do is we actually use that, cap that extensibility and those capabilities to improve, to lock down, to, to make things performant, to make sure that themes are, are operating as they should do. So we focus a lot on that, obviously. That's how we tie in all of our additional features that we add into, into WordPress. So we actually have a whole bunch of plugins that we've developed at Automatic that are available free and open source. Just a couple, listing a couple of them over here, HyperDB, the Object Cache plugin. Um, we have an, an Automatic CSS and uh, JS concatenation uh, plugin as well out there. Obviously, two-factor authentication is very important to us. You know, there's a standard one. There's all sorts of plugins for that. We have our own specific one, which we've written. We have SecOp teams that deal with that. But anyway, that's, that's more on the operation side. Um, the other thing about WordPress.com is we actually have a huge uh, new project that we worked on for the last two years called Calypso. And what it allows you to do is, is manage WordPress.com and any uh, WordPress.org installation in one place. But I'm not actually going to dive into that today because I want to keep this sort of apples for apples. So I'm looking at WordPress.com and the actual WordPress side of it and, the, and the, on the VIP Go side, the WordPress uh, side of it as well. So I'm not really going to touch on this today. Okay, so jumping straight in, databases. Most important thing to note is we run over a billion databases on uh, WordPress.com. That's a very scary number, and luckily not all of them are accessed at the same time. But uh, to, to, to handle that, uh, that number of databases, you have to know, you know, it, it does take quite a bit of work. One thing to note there is we, we started out on MySQL, and we're actually moving to MariaDB. Once again, a lot of the uh, open source software uh, reasoning creeping in there. So on the database side of thing, HyperDB, I mentioned it earlier, it's a drop-in replacement for the, the standard WordPress database um, plugin or, or uh, functionality. It's, you can grab it on the, on, on the WordPress.org. It's something we've developed and it's, it's available there. We're constantly iterating it. It has automatic sla slave lag um, and failed host detection. So w when you're setting up HyperDB, you set up your master and you set up all your slaves, it'll automatically send all the, re the, all the rights to the master and any counts or things like that. And any of the, the selects will go to all your slaves automatically and it'll, it'll detect if any slaves, or la slaves are lagging and it'll actually drop them out of the queue so they don't get any, any traffic until they catch back up. And it's, it's all dynamic, all done for you. So this is a, a very powerful, um, literally just a drop-in plugin that you can use to take WordPress to the next level. Um, also supports replication and partitioning. This is one of the things we use to make sure that, the, that we can partition all the, all the tables. So on the partitioning side of things, we take all the global uh, tables, sort of your, your sites, blogs, users, user meta, and we have separate uh, master slave sort of clusters for those. And then what we've done is we've sharded all of the, the blog data. This is the most important thing to do when you've got a billion tables, right? Can't have them all in one place. So we've got them across shards, hundreds of database servers, and different, and we have an auto, um, balancing routines that run, so they'll check how, which sites are, are more busy than others and we'll shuffle them around. It's a real-time thing and with HyperDB, it's looking these things up in config, so it's all, all easy, very dynamic and easy to do. Um, very important part of being able to scale up WordPress. And the other thing that we found is very important on the database side of things, if you're going to do any sort of debugging, especially on the systems team, is you're going to want to have query comments. You're going to want to have stuff in there, to write a little plug in, make sure any queries that are coming through, you actually tagging in the query comment what URL generated that, uh, that particular query. That enables you to track down what's wrong in errant code, find out what's happening, and get to the source very quickly. Because trust me, when you've got 120 million sites running and suddenly something goes wrong and all you've got is numbers to look at, it's much, much easier to just have that URL to refer back to. 
Another thing we do to improve performance on the database is we have a dedicated slave. It doesn't get actually touched in. You can set this in HyperDB. It doesn't actually get touched by any, any queries whatsoever. And it enables us to, to fire off any uh, non-production impacting database uh, backups um, as often as we like. Okay, obviously everybody knows this. Index all the things, all right? WordPress comes with standard indexes. If you've got something that's scaling, nothing wrong with adding your own indexes. Just make sure whenever you add new SQL statements, whether it's a theme, a plugin, or anything that you're developing, run explain on it. Make sure that you're actually accessing and using those indexes correctly. It's very important. If MySQL or MariaDB are not behaving, you can actually add in the use index uh, and force it to use the index that you need. But it's very important. You can't scale if you're not using your indexes correctly. Another thing which is very sort of contrary to what you'll find in all the documentation out there, we're running my ISAM on most of these tables. Now, everyone says NODB is the way forward, and it is for speed and performance, locking, all the fancy things that it does. But when you have over a billion tables, you can't afford the memory it takes for NODB to load up all these things up. You've got to have a minimal size to get those tables up in memory. You can't do that with a billion, well, you could do that with a billion tables, but it would be a very expensive exercise. So we actually run my ISAM until we get a blog or some site that's actually got enough traffic and it actually needs the record locking and all those advanced features, and we'll, we'll do a conversion on that, spin it up in, in NODB, and it's handled just the same as my ISAM via HyperDB and all the other things. All right, so that's DB, static content. This is what the internet would still look like if we had no static content, right? A little bit boring. So luckily we've got images and all sorts of fancy things to make that look a little bit different and have canvases. So just jumping in there on the images side of things, if you're going to be having sort of millions of images being uploaded a day or whatever the, the figure is, you're going to need some sort of a distributed fault-tolerant file system. Now, today you've got Ceph, you've got a whole lot of other ones out there. Back in the day, MobileFS is the one we chose. It's very simple. It's Perl-based but it's extremely, extremely scalable. So we have this in, in clusters and multiple data sensors, and when a file upload happens, we, we basically send uh, a copy to each of those DCs, and those DCs have replication uh, factors, so they just replicate automatically to make sure that we covered there, and then we do an immutable backup to S3 um, to ensure that if anything ever does go wrong, uh, nuclear warfare or whatever, we still got something theoretically in S3. So when S3 went down the other day, we actually didn't have any issue. We just had a little bit of replication back up there for a little while. All right, another thing that WordPress does when you upload an image is it creates a whole bunch of intermediate uh, image sizes so that when you're putting it in a post or different size things, it automatically selects the image size that it thinks best fits that particular layout. Now, that's great, but it's not cool if you've got a distributed file system in the size that we have. You don't want to store them. For example, I did an, an import for a VIP client, VentureBeat, actually, the other day. Uh, 4.7 million files to import, but without, with excluding all the intermediate images, it was only 187,000 images. So we don't, we don't install, uh, bring in all the other gump, we just bring the, the pure images in, and then we actually resize on the fly. And the cool thing about that is we, we have um, the exact width and image uh, height that's required for the, for the view that was, is required, and we literally scale it to exactly that. So not a pixel more, not a pixel less than you need for your, your display, which is very important. Once again, at scale, at huge scale, you pay for data, right? So these things are important and your user experience. You want to get that image there as quickly as possible. So this is a very, very cool thing to do. Um, and obviously, you can use that quite nicely with a responsive design uh, interface using source set, which is uh, something that you should definitely look into if you aren't already. Um, the other thing we do on the fly is we do prefer, perform image optimizations. I've worked a lot on this. This is one of my babies at, uh, at Automatic. And we make sure that we can do PNG, Quant, OptiPNG, all these JPEG optims, but on the fly so that you know, the first person who requests it doesn't wait an eon before they get the image. It's performant enough that it still does, you know, gives enough compression but can still uh, supply the client in time. And obviously progressive JPEGs is something that you should be doing as well. Another thing um, I actually worked on as well uh, is uh, WebP conversions on the fly. So some browsers, Chrome specifically, sends an accept header through saying that it can support image, uh, image slash WebP star thing. So what we do is we look for that and in the back end and we automatically on the fly, we instead of sending the client to resize JPEG or PNG, we actually change that to WebP on the fly, certain compression sessions, all that, and make sure that we cache it uh, you know, according to the browser that's going to be, going to be serving it. I won't get into how we uh, amortize that at the moment. That's a different story. Um, and then on the CSS, JS side of things, I mean, this is pretty, pretty obvious. Minified it commit is very important. Um, we have a plugin which you can grab on WordPress.org as well, which we did, which uh, concatenates on the fly, so you only have one single request coming through. Now, with HTTP2, that might not be such a, a huge thing because you've got one pipe open, you just request several things. So theoretically, is it really required? But the fact of the matter is it's still one request versus several. So it does actually help. The other thing we do is we do have dedicated static production servers as well. This helps a lot with serving static content because you can tweak that server or those, that pool of servers to be very, very specific at serving static content extremely quickly. All right. 
The next big thing, caching. So if you've got something on the internet, you want people to look at it, you cannot survive without caching. I'm not sure you all know that. So I'm going to focus on three different levels of caching that we do. Um, the server side, the data center level, and then, and then the pop on the outside. So just starting off uh, at the server level, PHP opcache, you've probably heard about this. This is where scripts are compiled and put into a, a bytecode that, that actually does all the running against your scripts, um, or against your requests, should I say. So what we do is we actually disable the automatic compiling of this, and we have actually plugged into our deploy system. So what happens when certain files are deployed, they're automatically invalidated and recompiled on the fly on each of our web servers as that, as that commit goes live out to production. So we find that's improved uh, performance quite drastically. So if this is something that you really want to do, I mean, it, it, you'd be talking milliseconds, but everything helps. Um, all right, and then moving on also at the server side of things, uh, PHP APCU is just like... Your little, it's almost like a mini memcache server within, within PHP. It's just a memory thing. You've probably uh, heard of it. This is great for persistent statics, things that, for example, uh, we turn off non-critical image optimizations. If we've got a huge amount of uh, load coming, creeping through the system for some reason on our file servers, we actually query this, the, the load of the server periodically. And if it goes over a, you know, those, uh, the number of cores plus a little bit more, we actually selectively disable some of those image compression things so that you don't have your servers uh, flatlining. They automatically sort of temper themselves and bring their load back down. And you can handle the requests. And then as things, as things sort of improve, things are turned back on and things carry on. So it's, 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 a, it's a very adaptive uh, system that we've built there just to make sure that, that we can continue to, continue to serve. Another uh, way that this um, sort of caching helps is if you have something that's consistently hashed, um, so you have a service comes into your load balance, it's consistently hashed, it's going to hit the same server at the back end because you may be generating files on the file system. Uh, M shots is something we do like this. We take snapshots of, of websites for little thumbnails. So here it goes to the same server, and we actually have a backup on, uh, on disk for, of those. You don't want to keep thrashing the, the, the disk for that if you need to query it for some reason for different sizes. So we cache a lot of that stuff in ACPU, so you, sorry, APCU, so that you can very quickly access that without uh, thrashing the file system. So very helpful. Um, on the data center side of thing, obviously, once you've got everything in a data center, you've got your pool of web servers, you're going to have to have shared cache between them. Um, shared cache comes with a whole bunch of um, interesting things here, but the, the object cache plugin that we do does shard cache groups, which is quite nice. So you end up having your cache separated to, the different, um, to your different uh, memcache servers automatically. So certain, certain uh, cache servers receive certain requests and others the others, so it goes, you know, it's consistently hashed. It always goes to the same places. All right, so this is a drop-in um, plugin that we've developed that you can also grab on, on WordPress.org, and it gives you the, uh, the, the ability to use memcache uh, in the way that I mentioned. We also use an internal system for synchronizing the DC, uh, into DC caches. So sometimes you've got values sitting in memcache that you actually have to have synchronized. Sometimes it's not an important um, cache value. You know, it's something that can be fetched from the DB, so it doesn't need to be sent to certain uh, data centers, but there are things that you need to, like invalidating cache is one of them, for example. And it, that in itself is one of the biggest challenges with uh, multi-DC um, caches, is the whole um, consistency issue. This is something that you'll always run into once you've got DCs replicated, especially across the globe, when it takes 60 seconds for light to get there and back. Um, you're going to have issues with replication um, creeping in. So, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of this before. If you've got your master database and you've got your slave and you crack off a change to your master and you invalidate the cache, and while the synchronization's happening, some user requests in that DC, that memcache server gets populated with the current slave value, but the, the synchronization hasn't got, or the replication hasn't got there yet. Then the replication happens, now you've got a changed value, and your cache value is still sitting at the old value for as long as its TTL is going to keep it alive. And that's uh, very bad magic. That's not something you want to have happen. So uh, w one very important thing to do with that, or to overcome that, is to synchronize your invalidations with your replication. This is something that um, we don't actually have an open source implementation for you to look at, but Facebook's um, MC router, theirs is up and available, and they're basically doing that. I don't know if you know how it works, but together with the MySQL actual replication stream, they've tap tacked on, uh, as we are doing, tacked on the uh, invalidations and setting of uh, cache values into that stream. So as the DBs change, then you get your cache changed. So there's no ways you're going to get cache pollution. It's a very cool thing to check out. All right, and then we always call Batman, right? No, not really. Actually, it's a, a thing called Batcache. It's a, a very interesting, simple way of, of uh, protecting your web servers. Using Memcache, all it really is is a pre-rendered page gets stored in Memcache. So instead of having, you know, a request comes in, Memcache, uh, Batcache is checked to see if the page has been rendered before on that server. If it has, or on that day, DC, if it has, then it'll just serve that. And you get, obviously, you don't have all the DB queries and all the stuff backing that up. So you get a 40x uh, increase 
in, uh, in page serving time, which is obviously fantastic. So that's another level of uh, DC cache we got there. And then we also do some caching of static assets at the data, data center as well, um, feeds, sitemaps, we even some of our image services as well, so that when it pops up requesting, we've actually got them on another layer of cache. This is important if you've got things that, you know, they, they take a lot of uh, CPU usage to actually generate, like sitemaps and whatnot. It's important to have that. All right, and then this little graphic is to try and bring across the whole idea that um, pops are really important, points of presence. So, you know, I, we, currently we're at 22 points of presence around the world, so we've got DCs around the world, and any user within that area is obviously going to get uh, served traffic from that pop. That's very important because you want to be able to, to um, make sure that your users have a very quick response time to data. You'll be able to get the images quickly, be able to get all the static stuff, uh, sorry, dynamic stuff quickly. Um, some things we do at the edge as well is we only, we only cache after a certain number of requests over a certain time period because having, you know, millions and millions of, of sites, you might just be getting one request for, for an item. You don't want to stick that in cache and be storing it for no reason. There's a certain tipping point at which it becomes important to start caching things. So we have that quite finely tweaked. Um, another important thing with, at, at the edge that we use is OpenResty. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a cool um, sort of... You t well, using Lua, you can ex basically add a whole lot of features to Nginx, so you can have Lua code right in your Nginx, and you can do all sorts of fancy stuff, which allows you to, to do some interesting things, which I'll talk about just now. Um, the other thing that you need to do when you've got pops all around the world is, like I mentioned earlier, the speed of light, unfortunately, does let you down sometimes. So we've developed this internal tool called Mangle. You can ask me about this, because this is actually one, something that I, I developed. Um, and what it does is it uses any cast to, to initiate these invalidations. It uses encrypted UDP to make sure that we've got security. And it uses a gossip protocol to ensure that we've got eventual consistency as well. So uh, invalidations is an important thing, because you want to be able to do that in a timely fashion. All right, then the other thing that's quite important is distributing, because you want to use the right tool for the job at the right, at the right time. So, what this really breaks down to is things like um, do pings and WP cron. There are a couple of things that are built into WordPress, for example, that you don't want to do synchronously. You don't want to have the user wait or have any sort of impact on what the user's uh, um, page generation time is going to be. So we shuffle all this stuff. We've, we've developed an asynchronous job system, so we basically just palm that stuff off. If it's not necessary for what's going to be going out to the client, it gets shuffed off to this asynchronous job system, and the job systems just churn through doing that, whether it's sending emails, whether it's doing things with all these things. It's a very important thing to do. There are lots of uh, open source versions of these out there. Um, that you can put onto your site. It's, it's, it's important if you want to improve your um, user experience. Um, the other thing we do is we use Elasticsearch. I think anybody who's a big player in the world or playing anything really uses Elasticsearch. Um, it indexes extremely well. As everyone knows, it's pretty, it's for pretty much the most performant thing out there except some fancy things that the academics are working on. And we use that for full text searching on WordPress.com because when you get to, to obviously to, to huge scale, you need something like Elastic to have your back. Um, just on the log side of things and, uh, and um, stats coming in from applications or logs coming in that we can glean stats off of, we use uh, Kibana, Logstash, LogCourier um, to sort of manage all of that for us. The one thing that's uh, pretty cool is that Kibana just recently also has beta version of alerts built in, so you can set alerts for certain stats. So if certain things happen in your network, you don't, we don't have to build a separate alert system. You can just set these and you get pings, you get Slack alerts, you get whatever you want that... Uh, can basically tell you what's going on in the network, which is quite cool. All right, this is a big one, the networking. So once you've got these systems and these data centers, you obviously want to connect it together in the most optimized fashion possible. So we've tackled this uh, in a few ways because if it's not connected, it's not part of your network. So the first thing we do is we employ any cast for high availability. We also have done a custom tour setup as well, which I'll take you through, and we do some specialized uh, production traffic routing. So first, um, we all know what Unicast is, right? You get a TCP IP address and you dial it, for want of a better word, and you get your, your server at the end. We all know what broadcast is, broadcast, broadcast pings and things like that. Very simple. You get multicast, you register your multicast address, and you just get everything to that address. And then you have Anycast. Anycast is a very interesting thing because you have multiple points in the network, but you only act ever really get one delivery. So this is the key, key thing about Anycast, is you've got this places in the network, many, and you've got receiver one. Because if you get a request from a, uh, an end user, you don't want to receive it in many places, but you definitely want to have it available in many places on your network. So you want that address available globally, but you only want it to come in in one place. 
So this is what Anycast does for you. So Anycast is, I don't know if you know about BGP, but there's the internet that we know and love, and then there's the meta internet above that. So all TCP IP addresses are issued by ICANN or AFRINIC or all these places. You, they give you a subnet, and that is linked to an AS number. An AS number is an autonomous system number, and that is actually how the internet routes. The TCP IP thing happens within AS groups, and above that, in this meta internet, for want of a better word, you have AS numbers that broad, you have AS's that broadcast in, using BGP what subnets are available within that area. So in South Africa, you have the Sykes internet routing table, and if you go, you can go and actually, two Sykes to show in a sec, and you can look at the internet routing table. And it's, it's an extremely powerful, yet finicky thing. You might have heard of a few outages related to BGP, where we hit the international global internet routing limit, and suddenly the internet went wonky on the one side or when Pakistan decided to broadcast a subnet that belonged to YouTube, so they totally black holed YouTube for several hours. It's, um, if you ever wanted to break the internet, this is where you start looking. Um, <laughs> it also has brings some, some interesting things. In South Africa specifically, you have all these bandwidth providers that are buying their bandwidth from people that terminate in London. So when we moved and put our pop here in South Africa, we had a problem that when we peered with people locally, so you in a DC, you basically BGP broadcast in a DC, and then you end up peering with the big boys, right? Any traffic that, say, we send to Facebook, we want it to go to a local server in the DC, we don't want it to go around the internet. So we peer with people. But the problem is this local preference metric that they're, they're able to set, they can sort of determine where it gets uh, pulled in. So you can be in South Africa, and you can try and get to one of our sites, and you end up going to London, which is not really the, the best route to go from, say, Joburg to Cape Town. Well, Cape Town to Joburg, you don't want to go via London. So it can be pretty tricky to set up. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting thing, but extremely powerful. And how it works, basically, is it works on a hop length. So you've got all your pops around the world broadcasting this certain subnet that's available within your AS number. And so anyone who requests that number goes to the, to the internet reading table, gets looked up, says, okay, well, this is available in these pops, and this one is three hops away, therefore you get that one and not sent to some far country. So if you're in Germany, you get Frankfurt, what, what, what. All right, pretty simple. We have this um, cool map that we have. It's actually live. I obviously can't demonstrate it live now, but it it's basically samples every well, 100,000 uh, query, but it, looks, it, it colors it to the pop that it's actually being served from. So we can quite visually and, and simply see if, we have a, um, if there's some global Anycast issue, or should I say BGP issue, we can see here what's being pulled where. It helps us a lot. We've obviously got some triggers and some real stats and some graphs, which are much more boring to look at, that does the same thing. But it is, it is interesting. If you ever want to feel like a real hacker of the 21st century, you can just tell net into the Sykes. So there's an address there, but you can look it up. These are called looking glass servers. And looking glass servers all over the world, and you can basically just tell net into them. They're free, and it literally will stream the entire internet routing table for you. You'll see the subnets of IP address and what AS numbers that are linked, where, where it is basically found. So it's pretty interesting stuff to do. OK, so the benefits of Anycast. Firstly, it distributes your caches. It brings that network latency down because your users in Frankfurt, for example, are going to be right there. They're going to get served directly. They're not going to jump to the origin DCs, which are sitting in, in, in the States or, the, or in Europe or wherever they are. And it's easier to perform maintenance as well because your BGP demons around on these servers, you can basically just stop broadcasting. So say you wanted to work on your Miami pop, wanted to do some sort of maintenance, you just stopped broadcasting. All of a sudden, the meta internet stops sending any traffic to that particular port because it's not, uh, it's not advertising anymore, it gets, you know, a whole lot of reshuffling happens, no traffic comes to your server, you can do whatever you like, and then you literally just start up, activate your network again, it broadcasts that you're available, and poof, the fire hose of stuff comes landing on that server again. So it's really, really powerful technique. And the other thing it does, because you've got all of these, these servers sitting around the world broadcasting the same IP address, so you map DNS to something, it can be anywhere, so what happens when whatever the flavor of the month device is, some camera's been hacked, someone's DDoSing you with a million cameras, because they're all over the world, you basically get this distribution just by the sheer nature of any cast. You get this, this distribution, you don't just get one server being smashed, so it helps quite a lot. This is an example here, this is 170 gigabits DDoS, uh, it happened just the other day, and you can see there from those graphs, so quite nicely, well, not evenly, but it depends where the cameras are, I guess, but uh, you can see it being absorbed by all the different data centers there. Okay, then the custom tour setup, okay, it's not the tour with the onions or all the fancy stuff where you're trying to hide from the, pe the, the black silent helicopters. It's, um, it's basically about the top of rack. So we are, in the DC, you've got your, your, your server rack and you've got switches at the top, and those switches are basically switching the traffic for those servers, quite obviously, and that's connected to your core going to the internet where you're advertising. So what we do is we do any cast from the top of rack 
to, in our own DC to the core. And what that allows us to do, if, we, um, if you were listening just now, is that we're able to stop advertising on a particular switch so no traffic comes to that switch and you can perform maintenance on it and you can bring it back up. That's the one cool thing, but the really cool thing that we're doing is we're linking the two switches through the hosts themselves. So what we end up doing is we use VVR, v, there's a, sorry, there's a lot of uh, four-letter acronyms in the next few slides, so uh, bear with me. So we use VRRP, to, to, which is virtual redundancy, to link the two switches together through the host, and then you get your active-passive setup, and the gateway for the server is actually the, that failover. So if one switch fails over, it fails over to this switch over here, and your gateway is that. So the server doesn't lose connectivity, it can just keep streaming its data, data out. Um, we also use MLAG as well. This is a bit, maybe a bit over, over, over anybody besides a network engineer's head, but we use um, MLAG to form the single LACP port, which basically gives us active-active. Instead of active-passive, we actually get uh, both ways, so we get an active-active link, so they can, it can actually stream data up both switches. So if both switches are up, double the bandwidth. Super cool. What it also does is it is, um, oh, there's a little graphic to show you kind of how it works with your, your switches and your host and your, your DC with your BGP. Um, so you can get a little picture in your brain. Yeah, the, the cool things about it is we get um, much better IP address utilization. This is one of the design things that we went for. IP addresses are scarce, they're difficult to get hold of, so instead of having a broadcast and a subnet and a this and a this, having this Anycast uh, solution actually saves us IP addresses in the end, which is fantastic. We get sub-second failover if a switch goes down because we're polling every 300 milliseconds, so if something goes down, boom, 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 automatically fails over. One second should be better than one second, but I think sub, sub one second is not too bad. Um, and once again, as I mentioned earlier, easier switch maintenance by just stopping those, those broadcasts. And then the key point is the last one. So in a data center, any network engineer will tell you the thing that they just don't like to do is change layer two configs. Layer two configs at the DC level is the biggest reason for data center outages. Or outages. One misconfiguration at layer two, everything goes poof. And that is something we wanted to avoid with our setup. So what we've done is we've actually isolated. We have layer three going all the way to the server, and the layer two domain is the host itself. So if you mess it up, it's one host you mess up. You don't mess up the data center. A very, very key uh, feature there that we've, uh, we've gone for. The other thing we do is production route, uh, routing, traffic routing. You want to be able to hone your, your servers to be able to produce, to serve certain traffic. So if you've got a WP admin endpoint, you want it to go to a certain type of server, you want it geared in a certain way, you want all your PHP settings certainly, basically totally customized for that specific type of traffic that you're serving. Um, and with all the others. Another cool thing with Nginx that we use, by the way, we're, we're predominantly Nginx, it's the coolest thing out, is it's got the split clients thing, which at the global level, you can actually determine from your origin DCs what percentage of traffic goes where. And what that enables us to do is literally, if something goes wrong with our DFW, our, sorry, our Dallas data center, we can literally turn the, tra the traffic down to zero, split it up to all our other DCs, and then we can, whatever's gone wrong there can be resolved, and then we can turn it back up. It's very cool, and it allows you to fiddle with how you serve things if you get new servers and new pools and whatnot. Powerful. All right, and then the most important thing, protecting, because if you build it, these guys will come, always. So you have to be able to protect what you've built. So what we've got here is we've got some interesting things. As I mentioned earlier, any, uh, any cost just absorbs DDoSs by default. That's what it does. Um, we obviously, obviously have gone SSL everywhere like everybody else has. We were a big supporter of Let's Encrypt um, from the beginning. And uh, we've actually deployed it. If you think about it, if you think about the number of sites that we've got, and you think about the number of domains, you think about then you have to have SSL configs for each of those domains in your Nginx config. Okay, how long is that file going to be? Far too, far too long. There's no way you could do it. It's absolutely, practically impossible. So what we do there is we use, we return to our good friend OpenResty, and we built a custom SSL uh, fetching, validating, and loading routines into Nginx, so it dynamically loads the certificates that's required to serve traffic in that DC. And as you can imagine, traffic, traffic's ebb and flow, so certain sites are busy certain times a day, certain other time, so you just automatically get this very cool self-regulated system where you don't have to worry about reams and reams of SSL configuration. It's a very important thing to do if you're going to be scaling um, SSL. The other thing we do, very simplistic, I mean, like I said, simplicity scales. We use IP set, I don't know if you know about it, but it's a way of just adding simple IP addresses to a, a named set, and then we have firewall rules that reference those, those um, those specific names, and then what we do is we have algorithms that churn through logs, churn through traffic, and we identify any nefarious activity, and we just add them dynamically to those IP set rules, and as a, as a result, your uh, a firewall is automatically filtering those IP addresses as and when, they, when it's required. 
We also use OpenRST once again. You've seen this, there's a bit of a theme here, isn't there? We use um, OpenRST for SSL blocking because you can't do a lot of the stuff that you can do with HTTP, the scanning of headers and whatnot, you can't do in HTTPS. So we rely on uh, OpenRST to help us with that. And we have algorithms that we've built in there. Then the other thing, if you have a WordPress, everybody knows this, it's a big sad panda moment. When you put a WordPress installation out, spam. So this is a big thing. This is something that you have to combat and it's something you have to be active about because unfortunately Google relies on these metrics of cross-posting and cross-linking, so you need to protect against it. And we've actually developed something for this called Kisme or Kismet. And uh, this basically can scale massively and it's, it's constantly filtering spam from millions of sites in real time um, permanently. It's available through our Jetpack thing, but it's built into WordPress.com. Um, it's, it's just part of the package. All right, constant integration. Just uh, quickly through this, if you, obviously, like I said before, you're gonna need to be able to change what's in production. We actually have a very, very pro change um, environment where we commit up to 100 times a day live to production. And how we do this is we have a thing called a sandbox. A sandbox is basically checked out production code. Every developer gets his own one. Uh, well, if, they, if they've got commit access, that is. And they can basically set their host file on their local machine to point to the sandbox IP address and then they can, whatever domain they want to debug for that day, whatever theirs is, they can set that host value and all traffic goes through their sandbox, still accessing the production databases and memcache servers, but allows them to debug and look at stuff happening real time, as it would be for a client anywhere in the world. Very powerful, very powerful for debugging, fixing, and also for adding new features. If you, you set up your own test site, you could map it through to your sandbox and you can go crazy, change the code on your site until you know, cows come home, you're going to be safe, all your memcache is stored separately anyway, so you're not going to pollute anything and you can develop new features. So this is how we allow, well, how we have our engineers develop and test code and then push it directly from their sandboxes straight into production. Um, pretty awesome. We obviously, we have deploy tests and validations built into that to try and prevent any uh, red tides, as I call them, as they, when things go wrong, right? There's a red tide on the alert, not good. Um, anyway, we also use Tim, Team City as well. Um, does great parallel tests. I'm not going to get into this too much, PHP units and whatnot. Um, WordPress.com also still being very SBN based. Okay, stats and analysis, going to very much fly through this. I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, we've got a custom built track system, which is just a PHP driven uh, stat system where we just uh, sort of asynchronously uh, increment our stats. We scoop that into Hadoop and then we use H2 to, to, to query that, right? These are all just, if you're into big data, these are things you know. I don't have to go into it. You can just read the docs, right? Or the man pages. Okay, then going on to the second half. So now I'm gonna look at VIP Go. This is, we've sort of looked at the pillars or the little verticals in WordPress.com. So VIP Go was, okay, so we've got this thing, it's managed and stuff, but we've got some clients that wanna be able to add their own themes that aren't vetted by us and aren't, you know, scrutinized and maybe not as performant, but they wanna be able to do it. And we're talking about some very big clients here. So what we decided to do is build something that had shared infrastructure, but it was an isolated client platform. So if a client makes a mistake, it's only their problem, only their stuff slaves up and it uh, doesn't work. Uh, we also want to have no restrictions, as I mentioned, on plugins. We want to be able to seamlessly deploy from dev to test to staging to production. There must be a seamless uh, sort of process. And we want to have an integrated review process, just like we have on .com, where if a client uh, com commits code, we review it before we allow it to, to go onto WordPress.com, so everything's vetted and performant and, as I say, secure. Um, so, yeah. What we were looking for was somewhere between Chirut and VM, somewhere in the middle there. And if you've been on this, I mean, you, you, I'm sure you all know what the answer is, which is containers. Um, I don't think I have to go into this. Everybody knows what containers are at this, uh, in this day and age. The one thing we did right in the beginning, because this is going back a few years, is we decided whether we we're going to go with Docker or whether we, we would go with pure LXE, uh, you know, the Linux container, which is basically Docker is just a wrapper over LXE. Um, and we decided to go for Docker for that exact reason. Being a wrapper, it made things easier. It was quick to just get Wheezy up and running or get some version of Debian up and running. So we ended up going with Docker. Interestingly, interestingly something changed. I'll cover a few of those things in a minute. Um, so then just the helicopter view of this, we have a container-based um, hosting platform, we have an internal Docker registry with all the images that we pull, that, we, uh, that we're launching up, whether it's DB or Memcache or web, and then we've developed our own container orchestration system, which works on host actions, so you can script a whole bunch of host actions, and they fire off on different hosts, so if you're going to create two DBs, two Memcaches, ten uh, web containers, they basically get done in order to make sure, and then your configs get read on your DCLBs, your varnishes, and then ultimately your LB and traffic's turned on, and then everything's ready and traffic can flow. So 
custom built. We did look at Kubernetes. Obviously, Kubernetes was sort of production ready when we first started, but we have reevaluated. And unfortunately, it doesn't quite fit in with the way our networking works in the, in the company and the things it wants to change and automatically re reload. So we've stuck with our container uh, orchestration system. It's also Node.js API driven, just for, for, for currency sake, I suppose. And then just to, so the similarities between the two, the static content, the protecting, and the distributing workload is pretty much the same between the two, so I'm not going to even look at that. I'm just going to focus on the, the distinctions between the two, which would be the app containers themselves, the networking, um, some of the learnings we've got there, caching, CI, and then auto scaling, which is probably the key point. So on the app container side of things, we ended up going with our web and our DB containers, we actually ended up going more of an LXC route. LXC route means you use more SBN in it, and you have sort of your processes running within there, versus Docker's way, where you literally just spawn your, little, your, your single application and run that directly through, it, through network ports or whatever. Um, we run memcache like that, Docker style, so to speak, um, but the other two we run um, SBN in it. Um, you probably know this if you look at the Docker notes that uh, AUFS is the only way to go. Don't even try and stray from this path. It's a very messy place. Stick with AUFS and make sure that you pin, if you're going to roll out a whole bunch of things, make sure you pin your Docker thing, Docker version because uh, things change, breaking API changes, and we've had some pretty, pretty nasty stuff happening. Um, so that's very important. And the other thing is with the DB containers, we've gone InnoDB only here, no MyISAM. Of course, we're talking with VIP clients here, so we're talking massive sites, massive DBs, um, which is cool. That allows us to, to hone our backup tools, which, is pretty, which has helped a lot. Um, the web containers have pre-installed Jetpack Premium. Jetpack is a, another product that we do. Jetpack basically brings the power of WordPress.com onto a, a standard .org install. So we bring Jetpack on. It's a mandatory part of the, the installation on VIP Go, so we bring a lot of those features um, like Elasticsearch and a whole lot of the other things that are required to take your, your .org install to, to scale. And the other thing that we can do in, in VIP Go we can't do on .com is we can integrate um, New Relic. New Relic is a fantastic tool. It allows you such fine-grained grain, reporting on what's going on with every single request coming into your server. We can do this on VIP Go because we've got separate web instances, web containers per client, so you can link your, your client IDs to the instance of New Relic, and then you can have them log in and look at their own stuff, whereas WordPress.com, when you've got thousands of web servers and that request could land anywhere, it's, it's impossible to tie back. So a very cool uh, feature there. On the networking side of things, this is the one thing that I can tell you you have to do is avoid Docker proxy wherever possible. Natting in user space is just not performant. It, uh, it has let us down many times. Um, we are still doing it uh, up to a point on our web containers with lots of tweaks and whatnot, but use host-only Docker connect, uh, networking wherever you can and just build your own port allocation. It's very simple to, I mean, it's just numbers, right? Numbers within a range. So Dynamics uh, service, uh, service port ass assignment is, um, is important there. The other thing that we do is we have dynamic firewalls within our containers because you, know, you never know if you're going to get hacked. Once you've got isolated code and you've got clients running their own stuff and putting these other plugins in, you have to assume when design for failure that the thing is going to get penetrated at some point. And at that point, you want to be able to have only the traffic to destined to certain services you know, are permitted. So we have this dynamic, dynamic firewall within the containers. So if you add a new memcache server, the firewall gets reloaded and it allocates that, okay, traffic's now allowed, now allowed to go out to that server. Very important. Another thing is the ephemeral port range um, in Linux you should set. And the standard's not enough if you're going to be using the, the NAT version specifically. So you need to extend, extend that as much as possible. But just beware, if you have a certain port range that you are going to be starting your containers on, so say it's whatever, 2,000 to 3,000, make sure you don't lower your ephemeral port range into that. Because what you can actually end up with, if the, the kernel has actually allocated that port as a, in your, and your source address as a socket for some outgoing connection, and then Docker comes along and tries to use that port to listen on, poof, doesn't work. So just something to be aware of. Make sure that you don't overlap those two. And watch your contract table because it's going to get massive under load. All right, on the caching side of things, big departure from WordPress.com here. We use Varnish. We don't use Nginx. The reason for that is you get precise um, invalidations and finer control on what, what you can do per, per client. And, and uh, Nginx is not that, uh, not that specific. It's not, that, uh, not designed in that way. Another thing to be wary of with Varnish is hit for pass. It's the only thing that we've really been burned by. Every so often there's a hit for pass thing. When I say very often, it's only happened twice. But it is something you should be wary of because it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to control if it, goes, it spins out of hand in, in uh, production. Then the other thing is WebSockets. You'll have to do this. You'll have to have WebSockets in your applications. Somebody will have an API or something. 
you need to be able to treat this very carefully. In Varnish, they say that what you should do is you should use a pipe to just pipe your WebSockets through, and Varnish will work just as it should. Yes, it does. However, when you reload your VCL that's currently warm and firing, and it goes into the state where it's supposed to go to cold, and your new one gets loaded, this one, if there is a pipe that's still linked through that loaded VCL, it will stay active. Problem with that is, if there are health checks going to your back ends every five seconds, for example, from this one, all the health checks continue to run. If you then reload again and reload again, you can very quickly see that you're going to have a huge storm of health checks going back to your, uh, to your back ends, and that's something that you want to avoid. So if you're going to use WebSockets, just skip Varnish altogether. Just at your LB, look for it, and send it straight through to your DCLB or whatever your upstream is going to be. Very important. Varnish as well doesn't come out of the box. Well, the open source version doesn't come out of the box with TLS. So if you want to be able to do this, you need to set up some sort of a tunnel or just a, a little reverse pro proxy to uh, get your TLS traffic across, across to make sure that you've got uh, TLS everywhere because that's very important. Another thing is, even if something is as phenomenal as Varnish is, you can still have the leap second. So when the leap second kicked over, not so long ago, beginning of the year, a couple of Varnish inst instances seg faulted. And luckily, we had designed for such failure, so it didn't cause any issues. But it's important to always remember to design for failure. You never know where it's going to happen. Even if it looks robust, something will happen. On the CI side of things, it's Git-centric as opposed to the SVN. Um, here, we've, we've gone with this. We allow people to have GitHub accounts. They can have their own CI, their own integration, literally their whole own development in, in environment. And then we just literally... Uh, it, on webhooks, whenever a commit is made to a certain branch, gets sent through to our review queue if you want to review it, and then it can be uh, checked in our review queue and then deployed directly from our, our own internal systems from our engineers. And um, we also tie a certain dev, the staging, testing, whatever we do, uh, tie a certain uh, Go with sites, so they'll have a staging site that'll be tied to a certain branch and get, so if they merge a PR, it just automatically via webhook gets sent through and uh, deployed into production. Um, stats and autoscaling, this is probably the most important part. InfluxDB, I don't know if you've heard about it or using it. It's pretty awesome. It uh, yeah, does the job really well. What we do with an, uh, the, the API that we have when we request a new container to be, to be started up, it's very simple. It's just basically using the, the stats coming in from, from InfluxDB to determine which is the best host by looking at load, looking at memory allocations and whatnot, and then spinning up the container on the relevant host, well, the best host. We also have an autoscaling service which runs separate to that, also interrogating in FluxDB, and then it scales reactively. So if you've got the load creeping up or whatever creeping up, it'll basically trigger the creation of a new container, fire it off to the API. The API will look at the stats and say, that's the best host, and bang, you get your new, new container up there. At the moment, I, I'm actually busy working on the predictive resource allocation for, for this as well, because some, you know, well, not some, most sites go through their, their uh, usage curves throughout a day or throughout a week, and what we're doing is we're building a predictive allocation. So instead of having reactive where, oh, wow, the load's got to that point in time to start spinning up containers, we actually want to be proactive about that and predict that we're going to be needing those containers, start them up and be ready to go with production traffic from, from the outset. Okay, so just a quick summary here. One thing you have to do is shard your DBs like we do on WordPress.com or you have to shard your clients like we do on VIP Go. Very important. Your DBs are going to be your bottleneck if you're not careful. Cache at the edge, any cast wherever you want. Employ those simple IP set type defenses to make sure that people can't get in. Um, design for failure. Sync your invalidations with your data stream. That's very important if you're going to go multi-DC. And of course, very topical for today, today's world, that is, employ AI for resource allocation or planning. All right, and never forget that simplicity scales. Okay. Thank you. Woo!